So the students will have learned something from that, but not all that much. So the sad thing is, by just being concerned about getting the right answer as quickly, as painlessly as possible, you are cheating yourself. You're cheating yourself of the misery and struggle to learn how to think and then, ah, getting it on your own. Because getting through your courses and all is not just a question of getting a decent grade and so forth, a, certif a certificate afterwards. It's what really have you changed? Is the experience that you gained in this course changed you? I, I often ask uh, in the first lecture to my freshman lecture, I say, how many of you are serious runners? I can ask you, how many of you like to run? Nobody here? I'm surprised. Uh, well, usually there's some, and I say, you know, running, uh, if you just run for half an hour for three or four months every day, half an hour, it changes your flesh forever. Something called revascularization occurs because you pump the blood so vigorously, it opens up a lot of capillaries that weren't there before, that increases your oxygen uptake very much. If you give blood, for example, when the nurse thinks she'll say, your pulse is low, your oxygen kind, you must be a runner. And even when you stop running, as I haven't run much now for years, the pulse stays the same, all the rest stays the same, it's changed the flesh forever. So then I say, this course is to revascularize your brain. It's going to change it forever. You don't look as worried as my students did when I hollered <laughs> that out of them, because that's what it should do, in the sense that it doesn't matter where you run exactly, but if you do it the right way, so you're really exercising, it does change you forever. And that's what should happen in your academic career. You work hard on something, it makes a difference. You make it your own. If you can take ownership of the subject, that's terrific, because you need to get two things to succeed in the world. One is competence. You need to be competent about something. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to contribute in any way significantly to society or to your pocketbook and so on, practical thing. Competence. But you also need confidence. You need confidence that parallel with the competence. Sometimes people have too much confidence. They don't have the competence, and they have more confidence than they deserve. It actually, X, Y humans tend in that direction too bad. And others are handicapped because they don't have as much confidence as they should and deserve to have. And that's true, uh, has been in the past, true more of X, X people. It's less true now. Take Chao Wei, many others. Uh, you know, this last election in the United States shocked a lot of people. Uh, many, many women were elected than expected. Uh, in the U.S. now, more women go to college than men. If you extrapolate, they reach 100 percent in not so a long time, decade or two. So I just like to emphasize that the XX part of our species has a bright future ahead in science as well as other fields, and it's a good thing to see, because the XY are going to have to start catching up. Uh, will be good for everybody. So uh, that was a long answer to your question, but I hope I got a little of it. Well, I have a question about uh, your career. We know that you started your career in the West Coast of USA, in Berkeley, and then you moved to Harvard. So uh, I'd like to hear from you how difficult is the beginning of a career and how does it change after winning the Nobel Prize? How much the life of a researcher changes after winning a Nobel Prize? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, people often ask me, uh, and one thing I always 
say, which is true, is that I'm, of course, invited to give a lot more talks <laughs> and uh, interviews that the lady wants to interview me and so on, and uh, get in front of cameras a lot, lot more <laughs> than otherwise. But, uh, and, and of course, it was sort of stunning to see the reaction of my students and so forth uh, to this Nobel Prize business. It makes you wonder, why does it have such an impact in the way people think? I can remember walking across the campus and a student came up to me and said, shortly after the Nobel Prize was announced, and said, oh, so glad to take your course. And somehow there's a feeling that if a few days earlier I'd walked across, the student might have gone this way instead. <laughs> so, I don't know, but uh, one of my PhD students called and said he jumped up and down for 45 minutes when he heard the news. He was so happy until he was hoarse. Well, he was a kind of calm guy usually, so that was very puzzling why he should have such. I was very delighted that he was so happy about it and so forth. But so I asked a psychologist friend about this. I said, why do people get so happy about things like this? You know, when their favorite sport team wins the championship or someone they know gets a prize or whatever. And the psychologist said to me, oh, in psychology, we only study unhappiness, not happiness. I can't <laughs> tell. Actually, actually, I asked him then, I said, aren't there some ambitious young psychologist? Do you want to do the opposite from what has been done? And he said, no, no. But that's the latest thing in psychology, I understand, is the study of happiness. So finally, you know, 30 years later, they got to it. <laughs> so I don't know if that answers your question very much, but uh, I, I certainly have had a lot of interesting adventures that I might not have had because of um, so many invitations resulting from this Nobel business, but um, it's, a, it's also a little bit embarrassing. Um, people assume that you're automatically uh, uh, endowed with more wisdom than you can possibly have. And since I, I shave every morning and see the same face in the mirror, I realize the well, Nobel Prize didn't really change me that much. <laughs> so, but I've met so many interesting people uh, as a result. I have to be happy about that. And, and you feel a certain responsibility. You want to do your best to, since you've in effect been designated as an ambassador for science. And I feel it's a fabulous force uh, in civilization. And I love to encourage young people especially to recognize what a great career it offers. And uh, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, I think many students uh, underestimate what they could do in science. Science is something so much like art. There's so many different domains. You need people with very different temperaments and talents. Uh, you will find the right niche. And, uh, I'm afraid that it's easy for many of them to get discouraged and, when they meet it in school and all. I was so happy yesterday to be told that here in Brazil, there are 200,000 students in physics, chemistry, and, and uh, biology who uh, apply for a competition uh, to the physics and chemistry and so on Olympiads. That's really impressive. And uh, the 200, as I understand, selected out of the 200,000, so that's one in a thousand. The odds sound awfully small, but great that that many students go for it. So, very good. Any other? Ah. Where do you expect the Nobel Prize? The question was, was I expecting the Nobel Prize? No. No. Uh, people had, a few people had years before written to me saying they had nominated me for the Nobel Prize. I always wrote back and thanked them for thinking so highly of the work. But um, the fact is, I've asked Matt, what did you get the Nobel Prize for? 
And I have several ways to answer that, but the most important way is that I fell in love. Seriously. I fell in love, and I've found this is true of many other people who I know now who got the Nobel Prize, fell in love with a very challenging thing, again, that people thought was impossible. It was called a lunatic fringe of physical chemistry when we undertook it. And uh, I was convinced it was just so beautiful, I had to try it. It didn't matter whether it worked or not, I had to try it. And uh, it did work, so uh, that was such a joy and such a wonderful experience. It attracted to my research group, uh, even at the beginning, when I was assistant professor, uh, very ambitious, very able students who were not satisfied in doing more or less routine things for their PhD. They wanted to be reckless. They wanted to do something new, way off. And uh, that's why it succeeded, because so many able people worked away at it. And, uh, you know, we, we, we only, we did things back then that only later did we realize how hard they were supposed to be done because we were so enthusiastic and so on. We weren't worried about that, we just charged ahead and with luck and also being able to take advantage of what other people found. It's, uh, as I mentioned earlier, science is intrinsically cooperative. We found things that other people had done and say nuclear physics, it gave us tools we could combined with what we were doing. So uh, it was not just us. And uh, uh, so it was a wonderful adventure. And uh, I, I wasn't thinking of the Nobel Prize at all. And uh, I had uh, several times in previous years, the phone had rung. There would be a reporter asking if I would comment on the Nobel Prize because someone who had received it had suggested that they ask me to explain something about their Nobel Prize. You know, reporters always allowed to have a lot of quotes and so forth, so they have to. And uh, uh, in my case, uh, the secretary of the Nobel Foundation somehow fouled up. He telephoned the news that I had been one of the winners in chemistry that year to someone with a similar name who was a dentist in a near, nearby town. So I never got that phone call. Instead, I got a phone call from a reporter asking me to comment on the Nobel Prize. And I said, well, fine, uh, who received it this year? So that's how I found out. So it was a very pleasant surprise. And then, of course, I, uh, when I found out that it was shared with Yuan Li and John Polanyi, two of the people I most admire, uh, that over many years we had worked to the same kind of shared enthusiasm and all. Uh, that was a special pleasure as well. So, uh, certainly it's been nice. So, and I've, uh, I hope that you have uh, uh, got some notions from what I've said that will encourage you without worrying about Nobel Prizes or anything else. You'll find so many rewards in the uh, adventures you have in science uh, and the opportunity you get to share those adventures with other people. Uh, those are the things that are priceless about it. Thank you for your lecture. And I would like to ask you, about, because you talked that your students in your PhD help you a lot uh, to win the prize. How did you motivate and your, your students? How did you, what did you do to motivate and to stimulate your students? Uh, well, I think, as I mentioned, the students that were attracted to my research group, uh, <laughs> they were very easy to motivate because they, their personality and temperament and so on was such that, like, like me, they were susceptible to becoming unreasonably enthusiastic <laughs> about pursuing some interest, what we thought were very interesting possibilities. And so uh, I, I wasn't consciously trying to motivate the students. I, I can think of many conversations we had in the lab and so on in which I would be speculating about something and the student would get a little excited and then I would see they were getting excited so I got more excited. <laughs> so we were 
really a kind of lunatic. It really was a lunatic fringe. And uh, uh, I can recommend living on the lunatic fringe for a while. Uh, maybe not your whole life, but, uh, but so it's an interesting question you ask because I would feel sad if, uh, if students felt that somebody else had to motivate them. I mean, what, you have to find the self-motivation that matters. So hopefully you can, in your academic trajectory, you will bounce off enough different things to find one is, ah, for whatever reason, maybe I don't even understand myself very well, I like this kind of thing. This is something I want to pursue. If you have that, you're blessed because you, if you fall in love, it's a blessing. No matter what happens, you, you just know that uh, even if you have failures and disappointments and so on. That doesn't matter so much as the fact that you get to work on something you really are in love with. So uh, that's why I mentioned what I said. I was serious about it. Uh, I could explain you know, the work we did and all, but you can find that on the web these days, so don't, I don't need to go into that. But uh, I've told you the things that I think are psychologically important about it. It's a, it's a great blessing to find something you really get enthusiastic and happy to, uh, happy to work on. And you can find it, I'm sure. There's so many such things. You may have to look for a while. But, uh. Uh, we want uh, to thank you again for your seminar, for your talk, and uh, for your ideas. And uh, we are very honored to learn from you. And uh, I want to give you this gift, it's the uh, Ufskar kit. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Good. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you.